Okay, so this is a musical puzzle that was first posed by the Italian mathematician Giovanni Battista Benedetti in 1585, and the music is technically impossible, because if the tuning math is applied precisely, then the pitch inevitably starts to rise as the music repeats. G major becomes G sharp major becomes A major on into infinity. Here, let me show you. The phenomenon you're hearing of the pitch rising is the result of something called a comma pump. You might think of it kind of like a Renaissance version of the shepherd tone, that auditory illusion, but the reasons behind it are actually quite different. Now obviously if you were to play the sheet music on a normal piano, you would not get the comma pump effect. This video is clickbait. It's not impossible. Instead, in order to get it, I used a series of specially tuned pure piano sounds. To demonstrate them, I'm going to play you a simple G major triad in two different tuning systems, and I want you to tell me which of them feels more quote-unquote in tune to you. The first of these examples is what you would hear on your normal, garden-variety, equal-tempered, tuned piano. But the second example uses a special system called just intonation, where the frequencies of the notes relate to one another by simple ratios. Harmony that uses this system feels very stable and resonant to me. Singers will often talk about the locked-in feeling that occurs when they're singing and using these simple frequency relationships. It's good stuff. I love listening to and playing music with this kind of texture, but Benedetti's puzzle aims to show some of the dangers of using this system. And it all hinges on the fact that in the West we use something called five-limit tuning. Five-limit tuning essentially means that every one of the notes from the chromatic scale can be represented by a simple combination of octave, perfect fifth, and major third. So in order to purely tune a minor sixth, you would go up an octave and then down a major third. The big problem here is that you can actually get to the same note in more than one way, giving you different frequencies for the same pitch. So F might not actually equal F. Kind of like a musician's version of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Kyle Gann calls this the cosmic joke. Music will never be completely and consistently, mathematically, perfectly in tune. There will always have to be a compromise somewhere, at least if we're using Western harmony in five limit just intonation. This is what happens in Benedetti's puzzle, so let's break it down. Let's figure out exactly why the music is impossible and what that tells us. Buckle in, my friends, because it is about to get theoretical. Theory. So on the first beat we have three notes, a low G, a middle D, and a high G. That high G has the ratio of two to one, the ratio of an octave, and the middle D has the ratio of a perfect fifth, or three to two. On the second beat, the soprano voice moves to the note A. A is a perfect fifth higher from D. Now, to add intervals, what we can do is multiply their ratios. Now, to add intervals, what we can do is multiply their ratios. So, a perfect fifth, three to two, times a perfect fifth, three to two, gives us the ratio for A, nine to four. So yeah, we are <laughs> literally multiplying notes together now. If you wanted to, you could multiply C major 7 sharp 11 times an augmented fifth, and that actually would mean something in tuning theory. Not sure why you'd want to, maybe just to flex on your math teacher, but uh, yeah, you could, so. Theory. On the next beat, we have the notes C and E. C is a perfect fifth down from the octave G. Now, to subtract intervals from one another, we can multiply them by their inversion. To subtract intervals from one another, we can multiply them by their inversion. So to go a perfect fifth up, we'd multiply by three to two, but to go a perfect fifth down, we multiply by two to three. So measuring this perfect fifth down from the upper octave gives us the ratio of four to three for C, which incidentally is the ratio of a perfect fourth up from the root, which we can confirm by checking Wikipedia. 
hey, the system works, all right. E is a major third up from C. So we can take the ratio of four to three for C, multiply that by the ratio of a major third, five to four, to arrive at five to three for E, which is the ratio of a major sixth up from the root, which again, Wikipedia confirms. Sounds good, right? The singers will be singing this music using intervals that were based off of an octave, a perfect fifth, and a major third, and all is right in the world, and no. Of course, it wouldn't be that simple. God indeed does play dice, the world is chaos, and Wikipedia is, believe it or not, sometimes wrong. <laughs> Remember when I said that you could arrive at the same pitch in more than one way? You can actually get to the same note in more than one way. Well, in this case, the soprano voice A is being held over from the previous beat. So the other singers are going to need to tune their notes to that A in order to get a locked-in feeling. The way that we can derive the tenor E from the A is by going down an octave and then up a perfect fifth. When we do this, we get a 27 to 16 ratio for E, which is very different from what we got before. In this case, E does not in fact equal E. What's more is if we take this 27 to 16 E and measure down a major third to derive our C, we get the ratio of 27 to 20, which is not the four to three ratio for C that we got before. It's a little bit sharper. This interval, by the way, has a technical name, and that is the acute fourth. So good for you, C. You're looking pretty acute. So even though the numbers for the second set of pitches look more complicated, they will sound more in tune because they were tuned to that upper A that was being held over. The coup de grace of Benedetti's puzzle arrives on the last beat. This is where the sword is twisted. The soprano A resolves down to a G. G is a perfect fifth up from C. And if we measure the interval of a perfect fifth up from C's 27 to 20 ratio, we get a value of 81 to 40 for that final G, which is a little bit higher than that octave G that we started with. The distance between these two Gs is about 21 cents, roughly a fifth of an equal tempered semitone. It's called a syntonic comma. There is a whole wonderful wide world of these minor tuning discrepancies called commas. If you want to learn a little bit more, go check out 12 Tones' excellent video on them. But the pitch rising effect of this comma pump or comma drift is not merely academic. It's actually bedeviled musicians for many, many centuries now. In his book, The Fundamentals of Musical Composition, composer Arnold Schoenberg would write of how natural semitones differ in size from the tempered, a fact which causes choirs to get off pitch. It's very common for choirs singing a cappella without any instruments to end in a different pitch space from where they began through no fault of their own. It's actually built into the mathematics of many pieces of music. If they sing perfectly in tune, the pitch starts to drift. But if they fudge the tuning a little bit, the pitch might stay stable, but the tuning will suffer. That's the cosmic joke. We can never have it both ways. You can't actually have mathematically pure music without the pitch drifting. There have been many attempts at solving some of the problems that Benedetti's puzzle aimed to illuminate. He actually wrote several different puzzles, each showing different ways that you could have comma drift using just intonation. The solution that the modern world has kind of settled on is something called 12-tone equal temperament. The commas have been tempered out of the system. So we can play in every key, the pitch doesn't drift, but the tuning is not quite perfect. And so this is why Benedetti's puzzle is impossible. You can't play it with mathematically pure intervals and have the pitch stay stable at the same time. Sometimes you just can't have it both ways. You know, I didn't actually study any of this tuning theory stuff in music school. Very few people do, in fact, because music school is more about how music works today and less about why music works the way that it does today. And tuning theory goes a long way in being able to illuminate that question. Why? Why is music? You know, at some point, Europeans abandoned their system of just intonation in favor of tempered tunings that got rid of that nasty comma. But that didn't happen in other cultures, and it's not because that comma was unknown to them. In fact, it was Chinese musicians who first described a system of 12-tone equal temperament before Europeans did. It's just they didn't adopt it into their music. 
And that's what's so interesting to me, because tuning theory is so deeply ingrained in the musical DNA of many different cultures. It influences the kinds of melodies you can write, the scales that you can use, the instruments that you might build. Tuning theory cuts right to the heart of all of that. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you are as excited about tuning theory as I am. If you enjoy this channel, please consider joining my Patreon. And uh, I'm going to leave you guys with one of my finest creations. <laughs> I give you the Lick Comma Pump.